Hey everyone, and welcome to the chapter 10 lecture for Chemistry 100. Chapter 10 is all about the third of the three macronutrients, um, proteins. So we've already discussed carbs and lipids, and chapter 10 is all about proteins. So we're gonna talk about the chemistry of proteins, what they're made up of. The building blocks are called amino acids. Um, and we'll talk about how proteins fold and how they can become unfolded. And then we're also going to talk a bit about protein functions, particularly its function as an enzyme. Um, so my, my chemistry pickup line for you of the day is, hey baby, you're so hot, you denature my proteins. And you probably don't know what denature means yet, but you will by the end of the lecture. Next slide. Okay, so before we get into proteins, I just want to do a quick recap of some of the topics from previously in the course that are relevant in this lecture. Kind of like at the start of like a TV sitcom, you might get like a little pre like little clips from previous episodes that are relevant to the current episode. Okay. So um, first off, a reminder about oh, I'm gonna put myself right down here. Um, about synthesis and decomposition reactions. So we, we kind of saw this in this unit already with um, synthesis of triglycerides and polysaccharides, but we're gonna see it again in this chapter. So when we take two small things, smaller things, and attach them together, link them together, and pull out water, two hydrogens and an oxygen, that is a condensation reaction. And condensation reactions are a type of synthesis or building reaction. And then likewise, in chapter 12, we're going to be dealing with a lot of hydrolysis reactions, which are decomposition reactions. So just a reminder about those types of reactions. Um, enzymes or proteins function, one of their important functions is as enzymes and enzymes are catalysts. So just a reminder of what a catalyst is, it is something that speeds up chemical reactions without being altered itself. And it speeds up those chemical reactions by reducing the activation energy. So whether it's an endothermic or an exothermic reaction, it'll go faster if the activation energy is lower. And that's how catalysts, including enzymes, function. Um, another reminder about chirality and isomers, this uh, type of stereoisomer called an enantiomer. So remember that if a, an organic compound has a carbon that has four different things attached to it, we call it a chiral carbon. And chiral carbons have handedness. They can have um, a right-handed version and a left-handed version. And enantiomers are um, mirror image molecules that are not superimposable. And so just like with um, sugars, we talked about D and L sugars. We'll also talk about D and L amino acids, the two different enantiomers of amino acids. And a recap about attractive forces. Recall that there are four different attractive forces that we discussed, London forces being the weakest. And although they occur between all molecules, they're most important in nonpolar molecules, things that contain lots of carbons and hydrogens in organic chemistry. Um, Dipole-dipole attractions occur between polar groups or polar molecules. So these are gonna be ones that have an electron hog, pretty much, um, phone call, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, or chlorine. Hydrogen bonding is a really strong form of dipole-dipole attraction that occurs when you have a hydrogen that's bonded to an electron hog, oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Um, and that's just because they become very partially positive, those hydrogens do. Hydrogens bonded to carbons do not, because that is a nonpolar bond. But hydrogens in a very polar bond with an electron hog will um, become very positive, and then they are attracted to these neg partially negatively charged electron hogs um, on other molecules. And then lastly, ion dipole bonding, which occurs between ions, fully charged ions, dissociated ionic compounds, um, and polar molecules like water. Okay, so proteins. Proteins are very important biomolecules. They do provide energy, dietary energy, like calories, 
um, just like carbs and fats do. Um, they also play a role physiologically in acid-base balance because amino acids can function as buffers, so they help to keep the pH steady. They also make up components of our cell membrane. When we look at the fluid mosaic model of the cell, you see the phospholipid bilayer, but then you also see proteins embedded in it, right? Those proteins have multiple different functions. Proteins are really important in our bodies as antibodies. Antibodies are a protein made by the immune system that binds to foreign substances like viruses and bacteria and helps target them for destruction or inactivate them. So they're really an important component of the immune system. And then finally, proteins have an important job as enzymes. And um, enzymes are catalysts. They catalyze chemical reactions. And so it's their role as enzymes that we will focus on in this class. But know that they have many roles that you will explore in other classes. All right, so amino acids are the building blocks or monomers of proteins, the, the individual units that proteins are made out of. So the anatomy of an amino acid is it has a central carbon called the alpha carbon, and then it has four different things bonded to it, and they're color-coded on this slide. So the first one on the left here is the amine group, or the amino group. It's a nitrogen-containing group, NH3. This one is a protonated amine, meaning it's got, it's got an extra proton hydrogen, which gives it an, a positive charge. And then it has the carboxylic acid group. This carboxylic acid group is the COOH, but it typically in um, physiological environments, it loses that hydrogen and ends up with a negative charge there. And then we call this a carboxylate. So essentially, amino acids get their names from the fact that they contain an amino group and a carboxylic acid group. They also all have a hydrogen, and then a fourth group, and we call this fourth group the side chain. And R, remember, is a placeholder. That means the rest of the molecule. So amino acids all have these three groups in common, the amino group, the hydrogen, and the carboxylate group. But that fourth group, the side chain, varies. It's different for each amino acid. And there's 20 different amino acids, and they all have a different R group, a different side chain. So, um, the reason amino acids work as buffers is because they have this um, amine group here, the NH2, and the carboxylic acid group, COOH. But when you put them in water, basically in an aqueous environment at a neutral pH, what happens is the acid loses the proton and the amino group is a weak base, so it accepts the proton. And so you end up with this form. So this is the form that actually exists in biological systems, it's called a zwitter ion. So when a molecule has two charges, so far we've really only dealt with molecules that have one charge, like um, ions that dissociate and they become either a cation or an anion. But organic molecules, large organic molecules, um, can have a cationic group and an anionic group, so they can have multiple charges on themselves. And so a zwitter ion is a molecule that has charged parts, but overall it's neutral, right? So the charges cancel out, the positive charge and negative charge. So overall, we would not say that this, that this molecule had a positive charge or a negative charge because those charges cancel out, but they do have these charges in them. So uh, there are these charged groups sticking off. So we call this a zwitter ion. A zwitter ion is a molecule that has charged parts, but not an overall charge. And I just like the word zwitter ion. I think it's, it's fun to say. Um, all right, so these different 20 amino acids and their different side chains means that we can classify them into different groups based on the chemistry of the side chains. So there's four different categories of amino acids. I'll put myself up here. And the first one are the neutral, nonpolar amino acids. So nonpolar, um, these guys are nonpolar, and they're nonpolar because they pretty much all just have hydrocarbons. 
in their side chains. So in this diagram here, the side chains are highlighted in, in these green boxes. Okay, and you can see that with um, one or two, ex with one exception, really, this one up here, the tryptophan does have an electron hog right here, that nitrogen, which you would think might make it polar, but because it has such large carbon hydrogen groups, so there's this big aromatic ring here, and there's a five, you know, four carbon ring as part of this ring here. All right, so there's so many carbons and hydrogens that this one electron hog nitrogen gets kind of overpowered by the nonpolarness of this group. So, but all of the others would be really easy to predict as nonpolar side chains because they contain just carbons and hydrogens. So um, any amino acid that has uh, hydrocarbons as its side chain is going to be classified as nonpolar. So for the record, by the way, I don't expect you to memorize. You do not need to memorize all of the names and structures of the amino acids. Um, you will have use of a table. I will provide a table of amino acids that's convenient. You can also use your textbook and refer to that table um, so that you familiarize yourself with these different amino acids, but you do not have to memorize them. What I do expect you to know, though, is how to classify an amino acid. So if I gave you um, a made-up amino acid, like, oh, you discover this new molecule, and it's an amino acid, and this is the, you know, group on its tail, the, the side chain, I would expect you to be able to classify that new amino acid based on the side chain, whether it's nonpolar, polar, um, another thing to point out is the names of these amino acids. So they all have a name, like this one is tryptophan, but they also have abbreviations. There's a three-letter abbreviation and a one-letter abbreviation for each amino acid. That just makes them easier, um, sort of shorthand naming of amino acids, but we'll get to that. All right, continuing with classification. There's also neutral polar amino acids, so the second grouping are these polar amino acids and it again their side chains are highlighted in these dark yellow boxes here and you'll notice that pretty much all of them have at least one electron hog they have uh, like an OH group or an NH group and this one has an oxygen also okay so these electron hogs these very highly electronegative atoms tug on electrons and end up having partial charges. So these oxygens will have a partially negative charge and the hydrogens have a partially positive charge, which makes these polar. And that's why these side chains are all polar. The one exception here is this one with the sulfur and hydrogen, cysteine. Um, I'm sorry, the name is blocked by my little uh, icon here. Um, but sulfur is my mildly, uh, electronegative and so this one does does go into the polar classification and then a sort of subset of the polar amino acids are there are ones that act as acidic or basic so the basic amino acids um, or the acidic amino acids have a carboxylic acid or carboxylate in the side chain so a carboxylic acid is a COOH group and but like we said just like this the carboxylic acid in the um in the backbone of the amino acid in a an aqueous environment that group um, loses the hydrogen so it becomes goes from a carboxylic acid to a carboxylate which is um, the form of that carboxylic acid when it has given up its proton, its hydrogen, and ends up with that negative charge on an oxygen. So these are the polar acidic amino acids, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. You'll also sometimes see them written as aspartate and glutamate, depending on the table of amino acids you're looking at. Um, aspartate and glutamate. I won't write out glutamate because that's in the link. Okay, aspartate and glutamate. So technically what's pictured here is aspartate. So notice this is a carboxylic acid. This is a carboxylate. 
So technically, if you write it in this form with the acid, then that is aspartic acid. And in aqueous solution, it loses that hydrogen and it becomes aspartate. So that's where those two names come from. But just know if a problem is asking you something about aspartic acid and you can't find it on the table, it's because it's called aspartate. So they're, um, for all intents and purposes of this class, aspartate and aspartic acid are the same thing. And glutamate and glutamic acid are the same thing. Um, polar basic amino acids, there's three of those. We've got lysine, arginine, and histidine are the three polar basic groups. And they contain uh, a basic amino group. So they have a, an NH2 in their side chain that becomes um, protonated. It uh, accepts a proton and becomes NH3 plus. And we can see those in the side chains are highlighted in blue here. So we can see these protonated amines. So they're not all NH3 pluses, depending on how many bonds they have, but they are all positively charged nitrogen groups. So um, I also liked like to point out in this slide, notice that in the previous slides, so if I go back here, all right, my side chains are sticking out to the right. And in this slide, the side chains are sticking down, all right? Side chains can be drawn coming off of any direction. So there's not actually a standard direction. They're not always pointing down or pointing to the right. So when you are trying to identify an amino acid by the side chain, you first need to be able to find the side chain, it's not always gonna be the group sticking down or sticking to the right. So you really need to be able to orient yourself. Find the center carbon, um, find the amino group and the carboxylate group and the free hydrogen, and then realize that the fourth thing, usually it's the longest part, but not always, is the side chain. So here's a, a sample problem. Um, and we're going to identify these amino acids using those tables. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is be able to identify the side chain. That is the part that determines which amino acid it is. So, oops. Um, all right, so for A, all right, the first thing I need to do is orient myself. Where is the side chain? Well, here's the amino group, the NH3+, and here's the carboxylate group, and here is the free hydrogen. So my side chain is this fourth thing here, and it does happen to be the largest group sticking off of it that drew, drew our eyes, so that one might be more obvious. So this is the side chain. It's a CH2 and then an aromatic ring. So now all I'm gonna do is go back to my table and look for a, an amino acid that has this as a side chain. I can speed up my searching by knowing which group to look at. So this is all hydrocarbons, CH2 and a whole bunch of CHs in this aromatic ring. So this is gonna be a nonpolar amino acid. And I can determine that before actually looking it up. I can determine that because of the um, elements in this side chain that this is nonpolar. So now I'm gonna go to the nonpolar list I'm going to lose my writing on this slide when I come back. Um, so here's the nonpolar amino acids, and I'm looking for one that has a, an aromatic ring. So these two here have the aromatic rings, and this is the one clearly, the phenylalanine is the one that matches. So this would be phenylalanine. And I think it says provide the three letter, and one letter abbreviations. So phenylalanine's three letter abbreviation, according to that table, is PHE. And the one letter abbreviation is F, because makes an F sound, PH makes an F sound, okay? So that's this amino acid identified. Now for part B, right? Again, we need to figure out where the side chain is. And we don't want to assume it's the one that's sticking up just because it was sticking up on the left-hand one. We just want to confirm, here's the amino group, the carboxylate group, and a hydrogen group. So here we are, we've got our side gene. Again, it is sticking up on this one. But again, 
on the previous slides, it was sticking down or sticking to the right. So we can't predict just by which direction the group is sticking that that is the side chain. We have to identify it by ruling out those other common groups, the amino group, the carboxylate group, and the hydrogen group. So the other, the rest here sticking up is our side chain. So this one has a CH2 and an OH. That OH, that oxygen group, is going to make it a polar side chain. There are no charges. There's no um, positive charge or negative charge. So it's not an acidic or basic amino acid. It's just a neutral polar amino acid. So I'm going to go back to that table and look for one that has a CH2 and an OH. So here's the polar neutral ones. And this is our winner here. It is a match for serine. So we would name this, the three letter name is S-E-R and the one letter abbreviation is S. All right, so some questions just might ask you, identify what amino acid this is. It's not asking you to do that from memory. It's asking you to reference the table and be able to identify it. And the thing that it's, it sounds like an easy thing to do, but what trips students up is the fact that in one image, um, the side chain may be sticking up, whereas in another image, it may be sticking, like in the table, it's sticking off to the right. And so being able to still identify it when it's oriented a different way is still an important thing to be able to do. So amino acids, those are the building blocks of proteins. We make proteins by connecting lots of amino acids in a row, in a chain, and we connect them through a condensation reaction. So this is a condensation reaction. Uh, in red, I've highlighted the hydrogen, the two hydrogens and the oxygen that get removed in order to make this linkage here, and that those two hydrogens and oxygens form a water molecule. So this would be a type of condensation reaction. Right? We saw this with, um, with carbohydrates as well. Monosaccharides come together through condensation reactions. And we call the linkages of carbohydrates, those are called glycosidic bonds right? um, to form disaccharides and polysaccharides. In proteins, these linkages are called peptide bonds. So this is really important little table here for you to keep these terms straight. There's a lot of vocabulary to master for these chapters. Rather than math, there's a lot of vocabulary. So knowing that glycosidic bonds or glycosidic linkages are what hold monosaccharides together to form disaccharides and polysaccharides. Peptide bonds are what link amino acids together in order to form polypeptides. Um, so these peptide bonds, uh, when we link two amino acids together, we have a dipeptide, two amino acids. If we have three, it's a tripeptide, and so on. So if we have many, it's called a polypeptide. So many amino acids linked together is a polypeptide. Proteins are polypeptides. Generally, um, a polypeptide that has 50 or more amino acids, then we start calling it a protein. Otherwise, we just call it a peptide, like small peptides. There's a lot of um, different hormones and neurotransmitters in your body are made up of, of like, you know, peptides that are like, you know, a polypeptide that's like maybe 10 or 11 or eight amino acids long. So it's not long enough to be considered a protein because it's not long enough to really fold. So generally, um, we think of polypeptides, 50 amino acids or longer as being proteins, but all proteins are polypeptides. So I often will use these terms interchangeably, protein and polypeptide. Um, proteins have a, the sequence of a, pro, of a polypeptide is directional. Um, so there is a start and an end. Just like in English, in any language that we read, we read it in a certain direction. So if I write my name S-A-R-A-H, it's pronounced Sarah. It's read Sarah. It's not Harris. Okay, that would be incorrect. That would be a totally different name. Even though it's the same letters in the same order, it's read from a different direction. And so proteins have a start and an end, or um, they have an end terminus 
and a C terminus. They are read and they're always written and always read from N to C. So whichever one has the amino group sticking out of the end, okay, we call that the N terminus, N for nitrogen of the amino group. And whichever one has the COO minus group, the carboxylate group sticking off, is the C terminus, C for this, the carbon and the carboxylate group, okay? So N is the start and C is the end. Terminus just means end, so these are both ends, but this is the starting end and this is the ending end, okay? And then the peptide bond is the one between, so I like to say that um, here at North Country Community College, we are in triple C, but amino acids have a backbone of N double C, so N, C, C. N, C, C. And if there were more, it would be N, C, C. So the peptide bond connects two peptides. So between the C and the N, so N, C, C, N, C, C. So between every N, C, C unit, that's where the peptide bond is. Okay. And so since these are directional, all right, just like S, A, R, A, H is a different word than H A R A S, okay. Um, amino acids that are connected, you know, alanine and then valine, that's different than valine and then alanine, okay. So it is important to get those, the order correct. Um, always the N terminus is the start and the C terminus is the end. All right, so in this question, the sample problem from the textbook, it asks you to identify the different amino acids, which one is the N-terminus and which one is the C-terminus. So there's a multi multiple part problem here. Um, first, it says circle the N-terminal amino acid and give its name. So here is the uh, N-terminus right here, this nitrogen, this amine group, identifies this as the N terminus and it wants us to put to circle the N terminal amino acid. So this is not the amino acid. This is just the amino group of the N terminal amino acid. So this whole amino acid here. All right, the NCC. Here's the peptide bond that's holding them together. So that would be the N terminal amino acid and we can name it by going back to that table. Which I don't actually want to do because then I will lose my drawing. So I'm you can go back to it. I'm gonna pull up on my phone a list of amino acids because I don't have them memorized. I did once upon a time back in college. I did have to memorize them. Um, all right, amino acids chart. Sure. That's good. Open up an image. Oh, here's the one I give you guys. Okay. So this one is the side chain has a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. So it is a nonpolar amino acid. So I'm looking at nonpolar amino acids. And there's two that look very similar here that have this, this branching of methyl, methyl groups. But one of them has a one carbon chain. The other has a two carbon chain. So the two carbon chain is the one that I want. That is leucine. So this is leucine. And I'm just going to write the three letter abbreviation, which is L-E-U, leucine. All right, now part B says put a square around the C-terminal amino acid. Well, this is just a dipeptide. There's only two here. So the other one, this is our square around the C-terminal amino acid. It's C-terminal because this the end that's hanging off is the carboxylate group. And now I need to figure out which amino acid this is. Well, there's no large group sticking off of it, which is confusing. Here's the amino group, here's the carboxylate group, and here is a free hydrogen. So this other hydrogen must be the side chain. This is the side chain, and there is an amino acid that has just hydrogen for a side chain, and it's also a nonpolar one, and it's called glycine. So we named it, awesome. Locate the peptide bond by drawing an arrow to it, all right? I located that when I was first separating. In order to draw the circle and the square around these amino acids, we had to know where the peptide bond was. And it's in fact right here between NCC1 and NCC2. 
Um, so there's my arrow drawn to the peptide bond. And it says give the three letter and one letter abbreviations for this dipeptide. So this would be Lu Gly or LG is the one letter abbreviation. And not GL, but LG. We keep that in, in the order that it's written in from N to C, just like we read English from left to right. Um, all right, so there also are not going to be problems in the homework online that will ask you to do this because it's difficult to do in, in Chem 101 um, software, but there are problems in the textbook and could be problems on the test asking you to draw a dipeptide. So not only do you need to be able to analyze the structure, but be able to draw the structure. So like I said, the backbone of a peptide is going to be those NCC groups. So an amino acid's backbone has a nitrogen of the amino group, the carbon of the alpha carbon, and the carbon of the carbo carboxylate group. So I always say start off with that NCC backbone. So in this case, it's asking us to draw the structure of um, alanyl glycyl valine. So alanine, glycine, and valine. And so we start with NCC, NCC. And then we add um, the ends, so the um, the hydrogen, the three hydrogens on the left end, the nitrogen, the N terminus, and the oxygens over here on the carboxylate group. And then on the carbon and nitrogen at the peptide bond, we make that carbon, we give it its carbonyl group, and we give the nitrogen um, its hydrogen group. So this would be the backbone for any tripeptide. All right, actually. Um, scratch that group three here. The third thing that we have to add is that free hydrogen group that's coming off the central carbon. All right, so this is the backbone for any uh, amino tripeptide um, with three amino acids. So the one thing that's left to do is to add those R groups, the side chains. So then you add the specific side chain for each of those different um, amino acids. For alanine, it's a CH3, a methyl group. For glycine, it's just a hydrogen group. And for valine, it is a um, what's called an isopropyl group. So it's got three uh, carbons, but they're sort of branched. So again, those R groups don't have to be sticking down. They could be sticking up um, just the way that we've drawn this, that they chose to draw it. They chose to draw them sticking down. All right, so what we've been discussing so far, where do I put myself down here, um, are the components of the primary structure of a protein. So the list or the order of the amino acids is the primary structure. But once we make this polypeptide, this long chain of amino acids, it will actually fold up into a three-dimensional structure. So the primary structure is often drawn um, or uh, represented as what um, is called beads on a string. So it often looks like these, you know, balls held on a string, the string being the peptide bonds linking them together, and each of the balls representing an amino acid. Okay, so if we had just a long string of amino acids, you know, that was kind of straight, then that would be a, a peptide that had only primary structure just a linear sequence. But the truth of the matter is that once these peptides get longer and longer, they start to fold up. And the first level of folding is called the secondary structure. And this is where short segments of this long beads on a string chain start to take different three-dimensional shapes. So the two forms in secondary structure are the beta pleated sheet, and that's when that bead starts to fold up back and forth on itself. And um, an alpha helix is another option, and that's when it coils like a telephone cord. So those are little shapes that different segments of the protein can have. Um, then the protein can actually, those that can actually fold up on itself in a three-dimensional structure. Okay, I'm not pausing the recording. Go take a, like a bathroom break. I'll be right back. I'm going to get a pipe cleaner to demo this. OK, 
okay, okay, I'm back. All right, so here's a pipe cleaner. All right, pretend like this is amino acids on this string. All right, this is a linear structure. So there's, imagine beads along this. And um, I take a section of it, and I'm gonna wrap it around my finger, and now I have an alpha helix. All right, and then over here, I'm gonna do bending it back and forth, back and forth. So I have a beta pleated sheet, okay? But then I have a whole bunch of the rest that's still not very folded up. So there is some three-dimensional shape here. We've got beta pleated sheet and we've got an alpha helix. This would be secondary structure. Now the whole thing kind of folds up into a knot, all right? And I don't know, like so, okay? So now I have tertiary structure, but I still have my alpha helix and my beta pleated sheet within that tertiary structure. So that's what tertiary structure is and how proteins have these different levels of, of structure, All right? If I had another pipe cleaner that was folded up into another unit, some kind of three-dimensional structure, Okay, and then these two units come together, then this, and now we have the fully formed protein, this would be quaternary structure. So quaternary structure is when you have two separate polypeptides that have their own, you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary structures coming together to form the whole functional unit. Not all proteins have multiple subunits. Some proteins just have tertiary structure. Only ones that have multiple subunits have quaternary structure. So this tertiary structure, the three-dimensional structure, the folded form of a protein is the only way that it works. So the shape of a protein has everything to do with its function. So if it loses its shape, like becomes unfolded, all right, we didn't break the polypeptide chain. It's still all linked together, okay, but now it's not functional anymore because we unfolded it. And that is something, I'm gonna skip ahead for a second, um, called denaturation, okay? When we unfold the protein, what we're doing is we're denaturing it. We are not breaking peptide bonds, all right? That's what happens in digestion. Hi, Athena. We are just breaking the attractive forces that hold together that three-dimensional shape. So let's talk about those attractive forces. Let's go back to primary structure. So primary structure is again that linear sequence. So just the straight, straight um, chain of amino acids linked together by peptide bonds. And for very short peptides like this one in the picture here, this is angiotensin II. It's actually a, an actual peptide that's important in regulating your blood pressure. Okay, it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different amino acids. So it's very short. So there's no room for it to do like an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. So it only has primary structure. Um, and it's just the sequence of its amino acids. But even long polypeptides have primary structure, um, a, a linear sequence of amino acids. So the primary structure is held together by peptide bonds. So the linkages between each of the amino acids. Um, the beta pleated sheets and the alpha helix, okay, so this, you know, coiled shape of the alpha helix is, you know, not held in place by a wire like this uh, pipe cleaner. It is held in place through attractive forces between amino acids that are sticking off here. So if you think of the little tensile pieces, as being like magnets that attract each other. Um, that's kind of what's going on in the secondary structure. So the secondary structure is held together by hydrogen bonds. And the hydrogen bonds occur specifically between components of the backbone. So if we go back to this picture here, what I have circled or squared in, in red here is the backbone, that NCC, NCC. And in blue, you see all the side chains sticking off. 
So notice that the backbone has all of these oxygens, which are electronegative and have a partial negative charge. And um, if we drew these nitrogen groups a little bit differently, if instead we of putting the nitrogen next, or the hydrogen next to it and we draw the hydrogen sticking off of it, all right, these are partially positive. All right, so there's partially negative and partially positive groups running all along the backbone here. And so when it folds up on itself, those slightly negative oxygens and the slightly positive hydrogens attract each other. Okay, and so the specific thing to remember here is that there are hydrogen bonds in the backbone. Hydrogen, they are held, the secondary structure is held together by hydrogen bonds between atoms in the backbone, not the side chains. Okay, the tertiary structure, that, you know, wadded up three-dimensional structure of the protein is held together by different attractive forces in the side chains, between side chains. So, where do I want to put that? Okay, um, attractive forces between side chains are groups. So it really depends on what amino acids you have, um, and that will determine what attractive forces they have and how the protein folds. So that primary structure, the sequence of amino acids, does determine the shape because those different amino acids will have predictable interactions based on their um, chemistry. So the different types of attractive forces that can occur between side chains is you can have nonpolar or hydrophobic interactions like London forces that occur between two nonpolar side chains um, that are hydrophobic, afraid of water. So what one thing that we're going to see about these nonpolar or hydrophobic groups is that since they are afraid of water, they tend to tuck themselves on the inside of the protein structure. Kind of like my cells with fatty acids will form with the nonpolar tails on the inside. Same thing when a protein folds, it wants its nonpolar stuff on the inside, away from water. Um, polar groups tend to be sticking up on the outside of the protein structure um, because they like water, they are hydrophilic, and will engage in hydrogen bonding or dipole-dipole attractions with water. And um, if you have two ionic groups, two charged groups, like a polar acidic or a polar basic group, they can attract each other because they have full charge, positive charge or negative charge. They can attract through ionic attractions. Remember, any ionic compound is a salt. So these ionic attractions are called salt bridges. And then a very specific type of um, a force that holds together that three-dimensional structure are called disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds are legitimate bonds. They are covalent bonds that form between two sulfurs. So when you have two SH groups get together, they get reduced. They lose hydrogen. Reduction is, no, sorry. They get oxidized. Oxidation is loss of hydrogen. So um, they get oxidized into a disulfide bond. So the hydrogens are lost and the sulfurs bond together. So there's two sulfurs bonded. That's why it's called a disulfide bond. And these are very strong connections because they are legit covalent bonds, not a type of attractive force, but an actual bonding force. So um, looking at this. Uh, protein here, kind of like the folded pipe cleaner. Um, we can see some alpha helix structures in the secondary structure. Uh, this one doesn't seem to have any beta pleated sheets. Okay, but then it all kind of folds up on itself even further, and we can see some of these attractive forces that are holding it together in this three dimensional shape. We can see a salt bridge right here that's forming between. Um, an acidic amino acid side chain and a basic amino acid side chain.
we can see a hydrogen bond, a polar interaction that's occurring here between two polar side chains that are sticking off. Notice that these side chains are not adjacent to each other. So they're not neighboring. They're not next to each other in the primary sequence. They're somewhere far away in the primary sequence. But when the molecule folds, then they get close to each other and they um, interact. So they may be very far apart in the protein sequence, but very close together in the protein structure. Um, some other interactions that we can hear, we can see some disulfide bonds that are forming between two cysteine side chains at different parts of the protein that have gotten close to each other. Um, we can see some hydrophobic interactions occurring over here between some hydrophobic uh, nonpolar side chains that are attracted through uh, London forces, but also notice how they're tucked into the inside of the protein structure. Whereas on the outer surface of the protein structure, we have some polar side chains that can interact with water and hydrogen bond to water. Okay, so these are all different types of attractions that that determine the protein shape. It will it will fold in such a way that nonpolar groups will be on the inside and polar groups will be on the outside. And oftentimes, if cysteines get close together, then they will um, become oxidized and form disulfide bonds. Um, if there's a lot of polar groups near each other in the structure, they'll fold up and form hydrogen bonds. So those are the things that hold the tertiary structure together. Um, quick sample problem here. Can you predict what type of attractive force will occur between two amino acids. Oh, that's not what this question is. This one is asking where whether the amino acid will appear on the surface of the protein when it's folded or on the interior structure of the protein when it's folded. Of course, hydrophilic, water-loving amino acids will like to be on the surface and hydrophobic, um, water-fearing amino acids tend to be on the inside. So we're basically just asking, are these amino acids polar or nonpolar. Tyrosine, if we look at the table, is a polar amino acid, so it's going to want to be on the outside. Say hi to my husband. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, since it's polar, it will want to be on the outside, on the outer surface. And Leucine, if we look it up on the amino acid table, is a nonpolar amino acid. Nonpolar. And so it's going to want to be, that means it's going to be hydrophobic, afraid of water, and it's going to want to be tucked into the interior. Interior. Of the protein structure. Interior. All right, but another question, type of question that you might be asked is what type of interaction would you expect between these two amino acids? So you would look up the structure of the amino acids and determine are they polar, are they nonpolar, um, are they acidic and basic, and determine whether they're going to have hydrogen bonding or London forces or form a salt bridge or a disulfide bond. So you're basically asking in these four amino acid pairs, which of these four attractions are holding them together? So these are your four options for this sample problem. Okay, so lysine and glutamate. Lysine, if we look up on the on our amino acid table, and I'm just looking at, at this one here, which is the same one I'm going to give to you guys um, as a table in a Word document or a picture. Lysine. Lysine is, hmm, it's a basic amino acid, so that means it's positively charged, has a positively charged amine group. And glutamate or glutamic acid is an acidic amino acid. It has a negative charge. So these are charged groups. And charge, they, they have ionic charges. So that's an ionic attraction or a salt bridge. Either one I would take as an acceptable answer, but in your homework assignment, it may only give you one of those options. So either ionic or a salt bridge. All right, salt or ionic.
um, attraction. Now for leucine and isoleucine, I look these guys up and they are right next to each other in the list under nonpolar amino acids. So this one is nonpolar and this one is nonpolar. So these are going to have hydrophobic attraction. Hydrophobic, they are water fearing. Um, or you could also say they have London forces. The hydrophobic forces are London forces. London dispersion, LD, is how I like to abbreviate that. All right, threonine and tyrosine. Threonine is in the group of polar side chains, and tyrosine is also a polar side chain. Both of them have OH groups sticking off them, alcohol groups. And so they are going to be able to interact through hydrophilic attractions. Hydrophilic. Sorry for the sloppy writing with my trackpad here. They are hydrophilic or hydrogen bonded. Hydro, whatever, I'm going to say H bond. H bond. All right. And then the last two, cysteine and cysteine. Cysteine, these are polar, but when we see two cysteines, all right, cysteines have an SH group. The unique bond that forms between two cysteines is the disulfide bond. So these would be, and the only time you get disulfide bonds is when you have two cysteines. So that's the only sort of specific one to memorize. Two cysteines means a disulfide bond. All right, so those would be the types of interactions that occur between these pairs. So you may have some homework problems that ask you that. What type of attraction occurs between side, these two side chains in the three-dimensional structure of a protein or the tertiary structure of a protein? All right, and that quaternary structure, remember, is when you have a protein that consists of multiple subunits, two or more, that have to come together. So a classic example of this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein in your red blood cells that binds to oxygen because it has this heme group. The heme group has a, an iron in it, and the iron is what attracts the oxygen. And then the protein, the rest of the protein structure around that heme group here. So there's actually four subunits in a hemoglobin molecule. So a single subunit is shown here. When those four subunits come together, the fully formed hemoglobin molecule looks something like this. So this would be the quaternary structure. All right, so this is just like a cheater table from the textbook that talks about the different stabilizing forces in the different levels of protein structure. So in primary structure, that straight chain of amino acids is held together by peptide bonds. In the secondary structure, so like our alpha helix or our beta pleated sheet, it's held together by hydrogen bonds specifically between the backbone, parts of the backbone. Um, atoms in the amino acid chain. Tertiary structure can also be held together by hydrogen bonds, but also additional types of attractive forces. But these are attractive forces that occur between side chains um, at different parts of the, of the protein structure. So hydrogen bonding, London forces, disulfide bonds, um, are all types of attractions that occur in tertiary structure. Quaternary structure has those same types of attractions as tertiary structure, but they're occurring between side chains on different subunits that are coming together rather than on different parts of the same um, polypeptide, which is what tertiary structure is. So a little bit about protein functions. So the structure of the protein is important because it determines its function. All proteins have specific structures that determine their functions. So whether it's a hormone, um, so one function of proteins is they act as messengers. Hormones are classic messenger proteins and they um, send a message 
by binding to receptors also made out of protein. So the hormone and the protein hormone and the protein receptor like have a very specific fit for each other. So their structure, if their structure isn't correct, then they won't fit and that message can't be received by the receptor. Um, proteins can be used for transport. We already talked about um, lipoproteins, so the proteins that help transport lipids, um, but also we've talked about channels. When we talk about transport, um, active transport and passive transport into and out of cells, facilitated transport of glucose, for example, requires a glucose transporter. So glucose is too big to diffuse into cells through the membrane, but it can go through this special glucose channel called the glucose transporter. So, and it's that transporter is made of protein. Proteins can be used for storage. Um, they can be used for con muscle contraction. Uh, actin and myosin are the proteins that are important for muscle contraction. They can be used to build structures, cellular structures. The cytoskeleton of your cells is made out of um, actin and um, uh, microtubules and intermediate filaments that basically act as structural components that hold up the structure of the cell. Um, oh, the example here is collagen. Collagen is a structural protein that is in your connective tissues that helps make it strong and firm. All right, and then the last function on this table is catalysis. Enzymes are proteins that catalyze or speed up chemical reactions, and it's these the catalyst function of, in, of proteins that we're going to focus on for the rest of the chapter. Um, so for all of these protein functions, whether they are, are messengers or receptors or channels or uh, enzymes, if the protein becomes unfolded, it will lose its function because its shape is really important for its function. So denaturing of proteins is unfolding of proteins. It's the disruption of those attractive forces between side chains, not disruption of peptide bonds. All right, so this is an important distinction. So denaturing is unfolding or disruption of attractive forces, the ruining of the three-dimensional structure. And things that can denature a protein are things like heat um, or acids or alcohols even, um, and even mechanical disruption, like just you know, physically uh, disrupting this shape. So a classic example of protein denaturation is in eggs. So um, eggs have very high protein content. So the yolk and the albumin, <laughs> excuse me, the albumin has a particularly high protein content. When you heat the albumin, it undergoes a very obvious chemical change. It goes from being this liquid, you know, yellowish liquid to a white solid. And so that occurs because the proteins in the egg are being denatured, they're being unfolded. They're not being digested. Digested is when the bonds, the peptide bonds break. That happens when you eat the eggs and you digest them. But um, when you cook them, you are changing the structure and by denaturing the proteins. Um, all right. so. Enzymes are proteins that act as catalysts, and they are very important for living organisms because we wouldn't be able to live if our chemi the chemistry in our cells went sort of, you know, at a natural pace. We need them to go at a faster pace in order to support life and be able to provide us energy at the rate of life. And so enzymes speed up chemical reactions. This is an example, hexokinase is an example of an enzyme that we're gonna use for the rest of the chapter. So it speeds up the um, phosphorylation of glucose. When glucose goes into cells, the first thing that happens to it is it gets phosphorylated. A phosphate group is added to it, and that actually keeps it in the cell, keeps it from escaping back out through the glucose transporter. And the enzyme that is responsible for that is hexokinase. Um, so the enzyme hexokinase, this is the, the 3D structure of it. So you can see some of the alpha helixes and the secondary structure. And here's the tertiary structure here. And here's the active site, this binding pocket. This is where glucose and ATP ultimately bind. And that reaction takes place. So the active site of an enzyme is the site 
where the catalysis takes place. It's where the substrate, whatever substance binds to the to the enzyme is called the substrate binds. So the substrate for hexokinase is glucose. And you can see if we zoom in here that the glucose is held in the active site through hydrogen bonds and attractive forces that the glucose molecule has with side chains in the active site. So the active site is designed with amino acids. There's placement of amino acids that will like ideally or optimally interact with that substrate and hold it in place. Um, so enzymes are very specific for their substrates. For example, hexokinase will bind uh, D-glucose, the D enantiomer, the right-handed enantiomer, but it will not bind L-glucose. It's the same molecule, just the mirror image, but it won't bind it because it won't have the correct uh, side chains to interact with it if it's in a different orientation. So we call this substrate specificity, that enzymes recognize specific molecules, even down to recognizing certain um, enantiomers, one enantiomer over another. So this is just sort of a graphic showing you how, um, if you think of an active site as sort of like these pegs, that if the pegs do not have the right shape, they won't fit into those little peg holes. And so um, that's why we can only process and um, metabolize D-glucose and not L-glucose. I spoke in the previous lecture about how L-glucose was actually examined or um, experimented with and studied as a potential alternative sweetener, a calorie-free sweetener, because we can't um, metabolize it, we can't get calories from it, but we it's still recognized on the tongue by receptors, by sweet receptors. So those tongue receptors, I guess, have less substrate specificity than those that actually metabolize it, like hexokinase. All right, so enzymes, in order to function, many of them need a sort of um, on-off switch. I call them sidekicks, so like Batman and Robin. But Batman can technically function without Robin, <laughs> but oftentimes he needs Robin's help. So enzymes, like hexokinase, often have um, little uh, molecules that they require in order to function properly. We call these cofactors and coenzymes. So the difference is just in the size, really. So cofactors are inorganic substances. They're elements just simple elements, usually in ionic form, usually metals, um, like magnesium, iron, zinc are all in their ionic forms. So magnesium ions, ion, iron ions, and zinc ions often function as cofactors. And coenzymes are or small organic molecules that we derive from vitamins. So when you talk about vitamin A, vitamin D that you need to consume in your diet, it's because these are small organic molecules that are needed by enzymes in your body to function. So that's why we, we need to consume them. So cofactors and coenzymes are just small molecules that bind to enzymes and basically activate them or help them function. Um, when a substrate binds to an enzyme, we said that it has that perfect fit all right, that, that substrate specificity. And this is called the lock and key model when the substrate just fits so perfectly right into that active site. Uh, another model says there are some enzymes that don't have quite the right shape for the substrate, but as the substrate gets near it, it causes a conformational change, a change in the shape of the enzyme, and the enzyme sort of fits itself to the substrate. So it's induced, the, that lock and key fit is induced by the substrate. So it's called the induced fit. Um, and this is an example, hexokinase is actually an example of an enzyme that has an induced fit. It's such a slight change, it's really hard to see, but if you look at the active site right here, you can see these little amino acids kind of, it looks like it kind of, um, closed a little bit around the glucose molecule. It looked, the active site was a little bit more open over here. And once the glucose has bound, the active site has folded up just a little bit around um, that glucose molecule. So another way to sort of shorthand um, abbreviate this situation, we call the enzyme E and the substrate S. 
So E and S are separate. They come together and they form a complex called the ES enzyme substrate complex. Remember, enzymes are catalysts. They speed up chemical reactions by lowering that activation energy. They bring together the substrates, um, the reactants of the chemical reaction, and so it can happen faster and more easily. It does that by bringing them together, so it, it increases or changes the proximity, decreases the proximity, so it takes those two substances that may or may not have crashed into each other in space, brings them together, and it orients them into the correct uh, orientation for that the bonds to break and reform. And it also reduces the bond energy. So by holding those molecules in place, um, the enzyme actually puts some strain on the bonds in the substrate, which makes them easier to break. And so those are all the different ways that enzymes reduce the activation energy. So just to show that um, if you have two substances that are going to undergo a chemical reaction just floating around, the odds of them finding each other, bumping into each other in the correct orientation is lower than if you have an enzyme that sort of, remember catalysts are sort of like the matchmakers in chemistry. They bring together these two substances, orient them properly so that that chemical reaction can occur. They also put strain on the bonds within those molecules, making them easier to break and, and reform ideally. So here's what's happening in the active site of hexokinase. Hexokinase has a cofactor. It says here coenzyme, but that's incorrect. Um, magnesium ion is a cofactor that binds in the active site. It helps to stabilize that molecule of ATP that's needed. That's where that phosphate group comes from. And so the glucose molecule, grabs one of those phosphates essentially and now the products here don't quite fit correctly in the active site they've changed their shape a little and so now the hexokinase changes its shape a little and releases those products so um, there are different things that affect enzyme activity so enzymes work great but only when they're in sort of their optimal environment so changing the environment of the enzyme can change its effectiveness or its ability to catalyze reactions. So um, uh, uh, things that can, the things we're going to talk about that, that affect enzyme activity are the substrate concentration, the pH of the environment, the temperature, and the presence of inhibitors. So my little picture of an, of an apple, of two apples here sliced, is showing you that um, when you cut an apple, and you leave it out for a while, uh, it becomes oxidized and oxidized apple flesh gets a sort of brownish color and it's kind of unappealing looking. And um, it's due to oxidation that is catalyzed by an enzyme. And we can reduce the browning of the apple flesh by inhibiting that enzyme and, and, and slowing down that oxidation reaction. So we can do that by altering the pH or the temperature of the apple. If you put that apple in the refrigerator versus leaving it out on the countertop, it will oxidize more slowly because reducing the temperature um, affects the ability of that, of that reaction. It slows the reaction down. Also, we can change the pH. A classic way to do that for apple slices is to add some lemon juice. Lemon juice has a nice flavor, but it's also very acidic, and it will keep the apples from browning. So add a little lemon juice and put them in the fridge, and you'll keep those apples looking a bit fresher. There are other substances that can be used to, to um, like food additives that can be used. So if you get like apple slices in a bag from McDonald's, they are very fresh looking because they've had usually citric acid that's been added, I think is, is, the, um, is the additive, but it inhibits that oxidation reaction. Also, oxygen has been removed from the bag. Sometimes they've been vacuumed, vacuum sealed, so that also reduces the oxidation. Okay, so um, starting with substrate concentration, let's look at that. So if you have a, a certain amount of substrate, so you have no substrate, okay, but you have some enzyme, it doesn't matter if you have enzyme, if there's no substrate, there's no reaction that's going to occur, right? 
So the more substrate you add to the enzyme, the faster it's going to produce product, the more and more product will be um, produced. But at some point, you're going to max out, you're going to have so much substrate that all of the enzyme is work, working, the enzymes are working as fast as they can, they can't work any faster. So ultimately, you hit a sort of steady state that as you, you increase the substrate, concentration, you will increase the rate of the reaction to a point. When you reach that sort of threshold point, then the reaction just stays. That's the maximum rate of that reaction or the maximum activity of that enzyme. So a great uh, analogy in the textbook is that it's like if you have some um, bike mechanics and you have a whole bunch of bike parts, okay? So these bike mechanics can pump out a maximum of 25 bikes a day if they have their tools and the tools can kind of are kind of sort of an analogy for cofactors and coenzymes and the workers the bike mechanics are like the enzymes in this analogy so the they the enzymes have their cofactors the workers have their tools and the substrate the bike parts are like the substrates Okay, so you give these bike mechanics enough parts to make five bikes, they'll make five bikes. You give them enough parts to make 10 bikes, they'll make 10 bikes. Give them enough parts to make 25 bikes, they'll make 25 bikes. But if you give them enough parts to make 40 bikes, they still can only make 25 bikes in a day. That's as fast as they can work. Okay, so if you give them excess amounts of substrate of parts, they still can only work so fast. So in biology, if you increase substrates, you will increase the rate of reactions up to a point. So I always kind of make the, um, the point here about, about nutrient supplements. So a lot of nutrient supplements contain vitamins and minerals, the tools that your enzymes need to work, all right? So if you give your, your mechanics more tools, yes, they can work faster to a point though. Once they have enough tools, all right, then they can still only process these substrates at a certain speed. So a lot of times, a lot of nutritional supplements um, are, are excess beyond. So taking an excess of nutrients doesn't necessarily help your enzymes work any faster. Uh, it just helps them work at their maximum rate that they can. So if you're getting enough nutrients in your diet and your enzymes are working at their max rate, then you don't need to take supplements. Supplements won't help them work any faster if they have everything they need already. All right, so other factors. pH is important. Um, all enzymes have an optimal pH that they function at, um, and it's not always the same pH. So, for example, pepsin is an enzyme that is designed to function in the stomach. The stomach has a very low pH. It's very acidic. It has a pH of about 2. So pepsin works really well at a pH of 2. It doesn't work well at a neutral pH of 7, unlike urease, which is a... Um, a enzyme that is made in the liver and it processes urea um, for, you know, from urine, from uh, actually from protein waste. Okay, so it happens to function really well at a neutral pH, uh, the sort of physiological pH of 7.4. So different enzymes function best at different pHs. So it's not that like lowering the pH reduces the activity and raising the pH increases the activity. No, if it's at a pH that is not optimal, it's going to reduce the activity of the enzyme. Doesn't matter if you raise the pH or lower the pH, if it's not at its optimal pH, it's not gonna work that well. Um, so the reason that changing the pH changes the function of an enzyme is because if we think of, remember amino acids, have this zwitterionic form where the um, amino terminus is protonated and has a positive charge and the carboxylic acid terminus is uh, deprotonated and has a negative charge. Well, when you add acid, acids donate protons, um, you, you get a different 
nope, acid is this way. If you add an acid, then that carboxylic acid group becomes protonated. It changes the chemistry. That can change the attractive forces that are occurring in the three-dimensional structure. If you have some um, ionic attractions occurring in the three-dimensional structure, adding acids and bases can change those groups and then disrupt those attractions. So it can cause the protein to denature and, um, and then it won't function properly. So that's why pH changes in your body are really problematic. If you get acidification or alkalinization of the blood that we talked about um, in the chapter, we talked about acids and bases and equilibrium, all right? Buffer solutions are really important because they protect our proteins from denaturing and then not being able to function. Other things that can affect protein function or enzyme activity is temperature. So all enzymes also have optimal temperatures that they function at, again, because increased temperature can denature a protein. Um, so proteins are usually designed to function at a certain temperature, and outside of that temperature range, they don't function as well. They slow down, whether it's cooler or hotter, they won't function as well. So for example, in the human body, the natural human body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius or about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And so that's the, the temperature that our enzymes function best at. When, and same thing for pathogens that infect our bodies. So when we get infected by a pathogen that grows really well at our normal body temperature, we can um, sort of slow down that pathogen's replication pattern by increasing our body temperature. And that's why we get fevers when we're sick. Also, the immune system is designed to actually, the enzymes in the immune system are actually designed to function better at higher temperatures. So a fever is actually an adaptive response to slow down the pathogen enzymes and increase your immune system enzyme activity. So if you can suffer through a fever, it's often recommended that you do that because it is actually adaptive, but it's super uncomfortable. So we often treat fevers and turn them down, but they are adaptive. They are actually helping your body fight off disease while they're making you feel pretty crappy. Um, another way that we use temperature um, to affect enzyme function to our benefit is using refrigerators. So milk um, contains bacteria, contains enzymes that um, will cause the milk to curdle. And if you leave the milk out at room temperature, this happens much faster. So we put food, a lot of food into the refrigerator to keep it cold to reduce that enzyme activity that ultimately leads to food spoiling. So keeping it cold makes it last longer because it slows down that enzyme activity that spoils the food. So here's a, a sample problem. Um, lactase is an enzyme that's produced by the intestines and it catalyzes the hydrolysis of disaccharide, of the, the disaccharide lactose into the monosaccharides glucose and galactose. It's active in the small intestine where the pH is normally around 6.8. People can take supplements of lactase enzyme if they are lactose intolerant and it helps them digest lactose. So here's the chemical reaction. We've got lactose, the disaccharide lactose, that um, gets broken down into galactose and glucose, and that reaction is catalyzed by the lactase enzyme. Would the enzyme also be just as active in the stomach, where there's a pH of one or like one, two, or three, a low pH? The answer is no, it would not be as effective in the stomach. Um, because it is that's not the optimum pH for it to work. So if you take a lactase pill, lactate pills are just lactase enzyme in a pill, it's not going to start digesting milk much in the stomach. It will really get activated more in the small intestine once the milk moves into the small intestine. Um, would a lactase supplement act just as well on lactose if it's first stirred into cold milk prior to drinking? The answer there also is no. So if you add lactase to cold milk, it might break down some of the lactose in the milk a little bit, but it's cold, and that's not gonna be the right temperature for it to work. Lactase is work, designed to work at body temperature. It's, it's 
made in the intestines, the intestines are going to be body temperature, not the temperature of a cold glass of milk. Um, some other things that can affect enzyme activity are inhibitors. So inhibitors are chemicals that bind to enzymes and disrupt their function. So they can bind permanently or temporarily. If they bind temporarily, then it's reversible inhibition. Um, if they bind permanently through covalent bonding, then they permanently disable the enzyme. So that's called irreversible inhibition. Um, a lot of um, drugs, pharmaceuticals that we take are actually inhibitors that block the function. They block a receptor or they block some kind of enzyme. If they're blocking an enzyme in our bodies, then we generally want drugs that are going to be reversible inhibitors because we don't want to have permanent side effects of, you know, a medication. So we want to be able to stop the effects of the drug when we stop taking the drug. So, so drugs, pharmaceuticals, especially ones that um, bind to human enzymes, are usually of the reversible variety. Um, so reversible inhibitors, uh, a con one type of reversible inhibitor um, is a competitive inhibitor. Competitive inhibitors work by competing for the active site. So if this is the normal substrate that binds to the enzyme and makes product, right? If we want to inhibit this enzyme with a competitive inhibitor, we want to design an inhibitor that looks very similar to the substrate in terms of its structure, that it can trick the enzyme into thinking it's the substrate and then it binds there. So a lot of pharmaceuticals are designed like this. They mimic the substrate and then they compete for the active site. So by taking the medication, you the inhibitor outcompetes that substrate. If you stop taking the medication or you lower the dose, then you lower the amount of inhibition and the substrate can kind of take over. So that's how sort of dosages often affect uh, medication. Different people have different doses, need different dosages because of having different amounts of natural amounts of substrate. I'm thinking right now of like um, psych psychiatric drugs uh, that work. On neurotransmitters. A non-competitive inhibitor is one that binds to a different point on the enzyme and causes it to change shape so that it can't bind the substrate anymore. So um, a non-competitive inhibitor will bind at a different site and change the shape of the active site so now the substrate cannot bind. All right, so non-competitive inhibitors, they're not competing for the active site and the dosage here is going to be less important because there's no competition so it's not like the more inhibitor you add the more substrate gets blocked um, if you have enough inhibitor to block the enzymes you block the enzymes and and the substrate can't can't get in there at all um, so some inhibitors in medicine so the antidepressants are the ones i'm kind of thinking about it's reversible inhibitors they bind to receptors so a common class of antidepressants are the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and they um, bind to the uh, transporter here that, re that takes in. So serotonin is secreted at the synapse here. It's received by the serotonin receptor, and then it gets taken back up into the synapse. So the longer it's there in the synapse, the more signaling it results in. And serotonin is sort of like a happy neurotransmitter. So by, by inhibiting that reuptake of serotonin, the serotonin sits there longer and gets more sort of happy signaling going on. Um, and so this is a type of reversible inhibition. This inhibitor can be removed. Um, so when you stop taking the medication, it stops having that function. Antibiotics, on the other hand, since they are targeting pathogen enzymes, not our enzymes, not, not things in our body, they're targeting the bacteria. Um, in that case, we like to use irreversible inhibitors. We want to permanently inhibit those bacteria from replicating and being successful. We don't want reversible inhibition. We don't care about side effects to the bacteria. We want to permanently disable them. So penicillin 
is um, a drug that is irreversible, causes irreversible inhibition of enzymes that build cell walls in bacteria. And it's a type of competitive, uh, sort of, it's a, it's a mimic, a mimicry molecule. So this is penicillin, and this is the cell wall substrate of the bacteria. So it looks very similar to the bacterial enzyme, and the enzyme is tricked into binding the penicillin, and the penicillin permanently gets stuck in the enzyme, so now it can't bind its natural substrate, and it can't build the cell wall properly, which leaves the bacteria very weakened and much easier to kill. So that is the end of chapter 10 lecture about proteins, and the next chapter, chapter 12, will sort of tie in all of this stuff between carbs and fats and proteins. We'll talk about metabolism more specifically, how these macronutrients are converted into energy in our cells.